vulgar display of power is what our shows are about. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are going to talk about Pantera, a band that changed absolutely everything for me, and I think for hardcore and metal in general back in the 90s. This is not going to be the history of Pantera, because you've heard that before. So instead of just basically summarizing their Wikipedia, what I want to do is dig a little bit deeper. First of all, exactly what was so special about Pantera that made them absolutely take over the metal scene with vulgar display of power? And second, their impact because I think not everybody understands exactly how incredibly big that impact was. I am gonna do my very best to explain all of that and more in this video, but first, I would love it if you would check out the Punk Rock NBA podcast. It's live now on all platforms. There's a link to that in the description. Number two, if you wanna talk about business with me, add me on LinkedIn. I'm doing a lot of stuff over there that I think is pretty cool. And number three, if you like this show, you can support us on Patreon. There's also a link to that in the description. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. Now there's some bands that take you a while to kind of warm up to and appreciate and then there's other bands for the very first time you hear it, you're like, oh my God, yes, this is my shit. And Pantera, for me, definitely falls into that second category. The first time I heard Pantera was at my dad's house in 1992 when they played the video for Mouth for War on Headbangers Ball. And the second I heard it, I was just instantly all about it. I had never heard anything quite like it. And honestly, I don't think I've ever heard anything like it since then, because they're one of these bands that although they've been copied millions and millions of times, nobody has ever been able to equal what they did. It was kind of what every band wanted to be. It had that like balls to the wall energy and aggression of punk and hardcore with those chunky riffs from thrash. The songs were at the same time like really simple. They were super catchy and full of hooks, but also had some just kind of weird off the wall, left of center kind of stuff that made it clear that these guys could definitely play. So it was all those things, but it was really more than the sum of the parts. And unlike Thrash, which had a lot of cool riffs, but I felt like the vocals are oftentimes pretty corny. There were a lot of bands like Exodus and stuff that I could just really never get into because of that. On the other hand, Pantera made sense to me as somebody who was also really into hardcore and punk. Because Phil looked and sounded like if a hardcore singer like John Joseph from the cro Mags or Henry Rollins was, well, a lot more talented, to be blunt. To me, he was like the ultimate version of the prototype that people like them had created. So I was instantly a fan and I actually got to see them in 1992. I think it was with White Zombie. And to this day, it was one of the coolest shows I have ever been to. I think that show was the first time that I ever stage dived. I remember like standing in front of like the guitar cabinet and it was so loud that I could feel my hair move and the highlight of the whole thing was I remember somebody got stabbed like 10 feet away from me which I thought was like the coolest fucking thing ever they stopped the show and Phil was like who's got the sticker punch that guy in the fucking throat and what could be cooler than that for a 14 year old at their first Pantera show anyway that was the last time anybody saw Pantera at a venue that size because you know what happened next on the back of this album, which captivated millions of people all over the world, just like it captivated me, they just absolutely exploded and quickly became like the coolest band in metal. And from there, they just kept getting bigger and bigger. Far Beyond Driven came out in 1994 and debuted at number one on Billboard, which is absolutely mind blowing. I mean, rock in general was more popular back then, but still to have a band like Pantera go to number one was definitely something special. When Celine Dion and Ace of Base and Mariah Carey were at the top of the charts, fucking Pantera was right up there with them at number one. That is how big this band was. In any case, I'm gonna kind of fast forward through the rest of the band's history because you've heard it a million times. You know what happened. After Far Beyond Driven, they put out two more albums. There were personality conflicts. The band broke up. Phil did Down and a bunch of other side projects. Dimebag and his brother Vinny did Damage Plan. Dimebag was tragically killed on stage in Columbus. Damage Plan broke up. Vinny did Hell Yeah. Phil did more side projects. Phil said a lot of really weird kind of racist stuff. Vinny unfortunately passed passed away as well a couple years ago, and that brings us to the present day. If you're watching this video, you probably already knew all that, so rather than rehash that history, what I wanna focus on in this video is why. Exactly what made them blow up like they did, and also their legacy. What kind of impact did they have on metal and hardcore over the next 20 years or so? And also, to what extent did Phil's various outbursts tarnish that legacy? 
So first of all, let's talk about why it worked. What exactly was Pantera's secret sauce that enabled them to take off the way that they did? Well, first of all, the songs. And I know that this might sound obvious, but I'm not so sure that it is. Because there's so, so many bands that have like kind of a cool sound. You kind of like where they're headed, but they never really put that together into great songs. And those are the bands that we all forget about, unlike Pantera. And if I had to really point to one thing that was responsible for Pantera's success more than anything else, it would be one song, Walk. And let's talk about what makes that song so great. Number one, that super simple, iconic chorus that every stupid little kid like me could sing in the mirror and feel like a badass. Are you talking to me? And same for that main riff. It was so iconic and memorable, but also so simple that every little dipshit, such as me, could pick up a guitar and play it. Really badly, of course, because one of the special things about Pantera is that even if you know the notes of their songs, for whatever reason, when you play it, it doesn't sound as good as when Dime plays it, because he just had that special something Thing that every other truly iconic guitarist like Eddie Van Halen has. You know, you can play a Van Halen riff, but it's still not gonna sound like Van Halen. You put those two things together and you had a song that was that perfect combination of super memorable, but also super accessible in the same way that Metallica was with songs like Inner Sandman, or a couple years later that Green Day was with songs like Basket Case. I mean, if I had a dollar for every time those songs made an appearance at some high school battle of the bands, I would have been able to retire a long time ago. The other song that I would say really helped them break through to that mainstream level was This Love, because that song got a ton of play on Beavis and Butthead, and I've talked about that show before as a thing that helped break a lot of metal bands into the mainstream. Back in the like early to mid 90s, that was probably one of the most popular things on MTV, which means that Pantera got in front of millions and millions of people when Beavis and Butthead made fun of their song on that show. I love how they would always refer to Phil as Pantera. This guy's dad must have kicked his ass when he was a kid. Yeah, really. <laughs> You're like, damn it, Pandora, this beer is warm. Get me another one. I personally hate that song because I don't like ballads, but it was objectively a great song and really showed what kind of range they had. That they could go from everything from a super fast, basically like crossover hardcore song like Fucking Hostile to a ballad and do them both that well. How many other metal bands in the early 90s could do that? Not many. And second, the combination of the three big personalities in the band, each of which could honestly probably carry a band on their own. Phil obviously being the biggest one, but Dime and Vinny as well, I think brought a lot to the table. Sorry, Rex, no offense. Every band needs a bass player. Phil was like that cool belligerent badass that didn't take any shit that every nerdy 14 year old like me kind of wished we could be. And then Dimebag and Vinny were like the ultimate cool Hesher stoner guys you just wanted to hang out and party with. This is kind of the same thing that drove the success of Blink-182 and Avenged Sevenfold. It's hard enough to have one person in the band with star power, but when you have two, three, or four people in the band with star power, that is when you have a band that has the potential to really hit that superstar level. And one thing they did that I think really took advantage of this, and I don't think it was any kind of calculated marketing move on their part, were the VHS videos that they put out. I had the Cowboys from Hell one, there was also the Vulgar Display of Power one. I think that these videos were a big part of what made them blow up because they showed off another side of the band. If you haven't seen these videos, it's kind of like Jackass or something like that, just the band out on tour with a camcorder fucking around and playing pranks on each other, lots of dick and fart jokes, that kind of thing that, you know, a 14 year old metal kid would love. And this was obviously way before social media, so a lot of times the only thing you knew about a band was whatever you saw in their music video. Which in Pantera's case, you know, their videos are all very pissed off and serious and intense, which is great because they're a metal band. But then on those VHS videos, you realize that there was more to them. You'd see them like fucking around and partying, hanging out, just being dudes. And you're like, oh, they're not all angry and super intense all the time like Danzig and Rollins. They're actually like pretty chill, cool guys that I would want to hang out with. And so that combination of when they're on stage, they're playing this really intense, aggressive music that you connect with, but then off stage, there are these chill, relatable guys that you also connect with in a different way. To me, that's a very, very powerful thing. A band that did the same thing 10 years later was Parkway Drive with their two DVDs that I think were really instrumental to them being as successful as they are now. And welcome to the Pantera Home Video Part Two. And kind of related their anti-image as an image thing. 
As a lot of you guys know, they actually did start their career as like a Judas Priest style, traditional heavy metal, almost glam kind of band, where they did do the leather pants and big hair thing. But by the time that most of us discovered them, they were the exact opposite of that. Rather than having any kind of like costumes or stage outfits, they would just get up there on stage in shorts and a t-shirt, the same thing that they were wearing earlier that day. As someone who was very much into like punk and hardcore, I identified with that because that's how things are in hardcore. It just made them a lot more relatable. In a lot of ways, I feel like they were were the idealized version of their own fans. The fans would look up on stage and kind of see themselves. Again, it reminds me of Blink-182, and I might sound like a strange comparison, but bear with me. I think that in the same way as Blink-182 were like, the idealized, super cool version of the suburban skater kid. Pantera were like the idealized version of the like Hesher metal kid. The core idea in both cases being that they were the idealized version of their own fans. A vulgar display of fucking lick. And another factor is their live show, which like I said, I can tell you from experience was fucking amazing. I saw them at a venue that's like about 2,500 capacity, which to me is pretty big as somebody who, again, was coming from hardcore shows. But even though it was so big, they made it feel just as intimate and raw as a local hardcore show. And I mean that in a good way. There was no barricade that I remember. They invited everyone up on stage. I mean, like I said, I got up there and stage dived. And I think at one time there was probably 15 or 20 people up there with me. And what's amazing about Pantera is that they were able to take that energy and translate it into much, much bigger crowds. You can watch the video of them playing to half a million fucking people at that festival they did in Moscow in 1991. They absolutely crushed and controlled that crowd in exactly the same way as they did when I saw them, or I'm sure if you saw them at a smaller venue, it was even cooler. But they were able to do that playing to half a million people. That's how good Pantera was live, and I think that played a big role in their success. And lastly, this will probably be the most controversial thing, but I think another big part of their success is that they were the voice for what I'll call that dude. That dude that kind of wanted to be Phil, you know, we can call him Chad or Kyle, whatever you want. That aggro guy with a chip on his shoulder that might listen to some metal, but isn't really part of the metal scene. This dude is just a guy that wants to put some heavy shit on that'll get him pumped up. Like I remember at my high school, a lot of the guys in the football team were into Pantera and they just were not metal guys by any stretch of the imagination. And so the ability to talk to the hardcore metal fan, as well as that guy in the high school football team, well, you can see how that propelled them to mainstream success. And there was really no other bands in metal speaking to that guy at that time. And whether you like that guy or not, the fact of the matter is that there's a lot of people like him out there and they're very loyal and they buy a lot of records. Pantera proved that to everybody. I think that's a big part of what took them to number one on Billboard. And I think bands like Limp Bizkit and Five Finger Death Punch noticed that and ended up building their entire career off of speaking to that same guy. And speaking of that guy and Phil being the kind of mouthpiece for that guy, I guess this is probably as good a time as any to bring up Phil's politics, if you want to call them that. This has been covered a million times and I don't think I really have have anything new to add to the conversation. But if you want to talk about Pantera, I think this does have to be part of the conversation. To make a long story pretty short, Phil has done and said a lot of pretty dumb shit over the years that a lot of people would interpret as racist. For example, yelling white power on stage. It's been a pleasure having all of you here and all of our musicians. My name's James Theo, stand up and shout. <laughs> now, how much of that is him being an edgelord and trying to shock people? How much of that is a crazy outburst from an out of control drunk drug addict? And how much of that is a reflection of him being an actual racist? That is all up for debate and I will let you draw your own conclusions there. But the fact is, as time goes on, this really starts to become a bigger and bigger part of their legacy to the part where I think it kind of overshadows their music in a lot of ways. Which brings us to the next section. What is Pantera's legacy? Well, to put it simply, they changed metal and hardcore forever, maybe more than any other band since Metallica. First of all, they kicked off the whole groove metal trend of the mid to late 90s, which I always thought was a really stupid name for a genre, but I don't have a better one, so I'll keep using it. If you were around back then, I would love to hear what you think, but to me, it seemed like overnight, the dominant flavor of metal went from thrash bands with skinny jeans and white high tops and big hair and usually high-pitched vocals, to overnight, the new default for a metal band was like a groove metal band in shorts, usually featuring some like bootleg Phil Anselmo clone on vocals, the angry guy with a bald head and goatee. And then of course, once Machine Head put out Burn My Eyes in 1994, that whole trend just absolutely exploded, which eventually led to some of the biggest metal bands of the next generation, for example, like Lamb of God and Devil Driver. 
It feels kind of weird to say that they brought something as basic as groove to metal, but they kind of did. And I think a lot of that is because they were coming from a really fundamentally different place than most other metal bands. You don't often hear people talk about this, but I think a big part of their foundation is, yes, partly in classic metal like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden, but also in like Texas bluesy rock. In a lot of ways, like, I kind of think of them as like ZZ Top on steroids. You can really hear that in a song like I'm Broken, first of all, like in the main riff, but also in Vinnie Paul's drumming, which really does have more in common with ZZ Top than it does Slayer. And I think a lot of that groove and tightness really just comes down to that amazing synergy between Dimebag and Vinny, which of course makes sense because A, their dad was a producer, so they grew up on music, and being brothers, I think they could understand and play off of each other in a way that really just very few other people can. And also by the time they got to that national level, they had a lot more experience than I think most of us realized. As a lot of people these days know, but we didn't know back then, although Vulgar Display of Power was the first album that most of us heard, it was actually their sixth album as a band. Like I mentioned before, their first three albums as a band were actually like Judas Priest style traditional heavy metal with a different singer. Phil joined on their fourth album, I think, where they got a little bit heavier, and then Pantera as we know it really came into being with Cowboys from Hell. Anyhow, the point is that I think a big part of the reason why Vulgar Display sounded so fucking good is because even though they were perceived as being a new band, actually they were veterans who had already put out five albums. And second, I think that they changed the sound of metal production forever. The production on Vulgar Display of Power really set the template for what metal sounded like ever since then. And I have to give my friend Doc Coyle credit for this because pretty much everything I'm saying here is stuff that he said in a blog article a few years ago. The big thing being like that super tight, clicky kick drum that was often played in unison with the chugs on the guitar and gave it a lot of that attack that we associate now with metal. I remember a lot of people taping like a credit card or a quarter to their kick drum where the beater would hit because they heard that's what Vinnie Paul did to give it all that click. I have no idea if that's true or not, but I saw a lot of people do it. And of course, the guitar tone. We cannot talk about Pantera without talking about Dimebag's guitar tone, which as Doc says in the article, is the best bad guitar tone ever. That super scooped, chunky sound that makes every palm mute and pinch harmonic sound amazing that we all tried to get with our shitty crate combos and metal zones. <laughs> I'm joking around, but really what I'm getting at is that as soon as we heard Vulgar Display of Power, that was the sound that everybody wanted. And it kind of still is, if you think about it, because really, if you listen to what producers like Andy Sneap did over the next decade with all those like new wave of American heavy metal bands, such as Doc's old band, God Forbid, really it was just taking that same sound that Pantera did to the next level. And it became this arms race where everyone was trying to get tighter, punchier, more polished, really just chasing that Pantera magic. And I hate to be that guy, but I'm gonna be that guy. I do think we have to give Pantera some credit here because whereas a lot of bands had to resort to like samples and editing and a lot of other studio stuff to get that sound, everything you hear on a Pantera record is just Pantera because they were that good and that tight and you gotta respect that. So you put all of that together and what you have in my opinion on Cowboys From Hell, Vulgar Display and Far Beyond Driven is the template for the next 10 or 15 years of hardcore and metal. The breakdowns at the end of Domination and By Demons Be Driven, Phil's vocals and just like entire persona. That's pretty much the template for every metal and hardcore frontman since then. Dimebag's tone, which every guitarist and metal has been chasing forever. Even if you think it's shitty, you kind of love it. Same with Vinny's drumming. I don't think there's a band in hardcore metal that wasn't influenced by Pantera in one way or another. I mean, really, if you think about it, that entire next generation of metal and hardcore, everything from the 2000s on, was really defined by the combination of grooves and breakdowns. And when it comes to grooves and breakdowns, there is no band that did more to put those ideas into the collective consciousness of metal than Pantera. So what it comes down to, to me, is that Pantera was more than just the metal band of the 90s, although they were certainly that. To me, they're one of those very few bands in the same league as Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden, Metallica, Korn, where you really just can't imagine what metal and hardcore would sound like without them. Well, you can hear our stuff, you can hear one note, and you know it's Pantera. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. Let me know what you think in the comments. What do you think Pantera's influence on metal and hardcore was? If you were around back then, do you remember things the same way that I did, or did I fuck it all up? Let me know what you think in the comments. Also, would love to know what you think about 
how much Phil's various antics tarnish their legacy? Does that affect how much you enjoy the music or are those two separate things to you? I would love to hear what you think. And also, if you haven't yet, please check out the Punk Rock NBA podcast. There's a new episode every Monday and there's a link to that in the description. Number two, if you would like to talk about business with me, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm publishing a lot of stuff over there that I think you will find interesting if you're into business. There's a link to that in the description. And number three, I would like to support everyone who supports us on Patreon, especially those who support at the true cult level or above. It is because of your support that we're able to do a lot of things, but especially the podcast. So I'm genuinely, sincerely grateful for each and every one of you. If you would like to support the show, there's a link to that in the description. Patrons get all the podcasts a week early. There's an opportunity to have me review your band or podcast or YouTube channel graphic design portfolio, anything else you would like to send my way. So if you would like to support us on Patreon, check out the link in the description. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.